Well, we're continuing in our Lenten sermon series, which is titled The Miracle of Mercy, the focus of which is how much mercy, how much love and action God has given to each of us, and how we in turn are called to pass that mercy along to others in very specific ways. We are, for example, to forgive the fallen and help the hurting too. And last Sunday, we were challenged to be patient with difficult people, with the folks who know how to push our buttons, who annoy and aggravate us, and yet for whom Christ also died. So how did you do last week? Were you able to approach one of your difficult people and because of the passionate message you heard at church that Sunday, do something different to make that relationship better? Anybody have a, have a celebration this morning? Well, talk to me afterwards. Hopefully you had some victories because today, today Jesus calls us to take it to the next level. To ramp it up, so to speak, because, are you ready for this? Are you ready? Did you come ready? Because just as mercy is patient with difficult people, it is also kind also kind to enemies. Enemies. You say, what? You say, what? I know. I know. I didn't want to talk about it, but here we are. And the truth of this is borne out in our text this morning from Matthew's gospel in chapter 5 where we find Jesus in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you ever really read that sermon, then you're aware it is one of the most radical sets of teaching the world has ever known. It is countercultural, anti-establishment, and flies in the face of many sacred traditions. It tackles several Jewish laws and takes them to a deeper, more loving, compassionate level. You might call the Sermon on the Mount the Christian Manifesto. And if Christians actually followed it to the letter, the world as we know it would be a very different place. So what are we talking about here? Well, let's look in chapter 5, beginning at verse 38, and see what we're talking about. What Jesus is doing is taking things they've been taught and bringing a new perspective to the table. He says, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. That's, that's justice, right? That's fair. You hurt me, I hurt you back. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. What? The audience said. What? If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anybody wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. What? If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Turn the other cheek. What is all this about? This is, a, this is the nonviolent response to violence, right? In the civil rights movement, this is what Martin Luther King preached from, wasn't it? No matter what they do to, you, to us, we do not respond in kind, right? He was seeking to have the people follow the teachings of Jesus. What happens in the garden? When the soldiers come to arrest them and Peter draws his sword and they're ready to rumble right there in the garden, right? They're ready to take those soldiers out. What's Jesus say? Ah, 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 ah. What? We're not doing that. We don't do that. That's not how we behave. That's not how we respond to evil. We turn the other cheek. That's how we respond. And boy, this was radical stuff, folks. And then it gets worse. Well, not worse, but whatever. You have heard, Jesus said in verse 43, that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now that's easy to do, right? Enemies are easy to hate, right? Because they're, well, because they're enemies. But I tell you, 
love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous if you love those who love you what reward will you get everybody does that right even the tax collectors do that and if you greet only your own people what are you doing more than others do not even the pagans do that and then here's the kicker you ready for the kicker be perfect therefore as your heavenly father is perfect I told you it was radical didn't I had you read that before oh my gosh oh my gosh that'll preach right we hope it will turn the other cheeks hard enough but then when Jesus makes that unprecedented statement the one where he says we're to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you I'll bet you saw some heads turn when he first spoke those words er, ears perked up the disciples mouths probably fell wide open catching flies why because this really seems to be going way too far doesn't it in the list of requirements to be a Christ follower it's over the top how is somebody supposed to love their enemy I mean think about it what's an enemy an enemy is a difficult person gone rogue an enemy is someone who feels hatred for us who fosters harmful designs against us who engages in antagonistic activities toward us in short an enemy is out to get us so where do you find them these enemies where do you find them everywhere they are people whom you may have offended and so you apologize and they refuse to accept your apology and they carry it on and on and on they're people at work who you've angered somehow or who are jealous of you because you got the promotion instead of them and so they set themselves up against you and do everything they can to make your work life miserable they are people in our families or our church who hold a grudge against us for some mysterious reason that we may never be able to comprehend who punish us with the cold shoulder the silent treatment they they, they shun with the goal of draining us dry and if you're unfortunate enough to have an enemy in your life right now then you know what it feels like it is scary knowing that someone wants to see you fall to see you fail it's exhausting to have an enemy debilitating it puts you always on your guard wondering what they're up to trying to anticipate their next move enemies rob us of peace and joy and hope they may pretend to be our friend in public but behind the scenes they are committed to one thing our demise they stand against us or they stand against people that we love and so the call to love them now that's a head scratcher and I venture to say it's one of the teachings of Jesus that we ignore the most that we skip over fast forward through on a regular basis it just doesn't compute so we hope that if we compensate by feeding the poor or clothing the naked maybe God will overlook the enemies that we fail to love I mean nobody's able to keep all the commandments right but the nagging question is why would Jesus call us to do something that is impossible for us to achieve doesn't that just set us up for failure why would our Lord do that maybe we need to take a closer look at what he actually says in the words he uses See, there are several different words in the Greek for the word love. One of them is philios, which means a fraternal or a friendly love, the love between family and our BFFs. It's where the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, got its name. Another word for love is eros, which is romantic love, the love that's shared between husbands and wives. So, so hey, does Jesus expect us to love our enemies like their family? like we do our spouses like our best bro in a word no the word Jesus uses for love 
in our text from Matthew is the word agape, which one person has defined as, quote, an unconquerable benevolence or invincible goodwill, end quote. It's a love that keeps on loving even if the love is not returned. Even if the object of that love is behaving in an unlovable way. Jesus is asking us to agape our enemies. To love them no matter what they do to us. The way that God loves us. Because after all, weren't we his enemies when he sent Jesus into the world? That's what Paul says in Romans 5. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of of his son. That's why Jesus came to tear down the wall of hostility between us and to help us tear down walls of hostility between us and others. Now, let's be clear about this. This agape love does not presume we're going to every bosom buddies with our enemy or spend the holidays together. We may never pose for a selfie with our enemy. What it does do is seek to keep our hearts open to them and what God might be planning to do in our relationship with them to agape them because just like us they are precious to God your enemy is made in the image of God and Christ died just as passionately for them as he did for us whether they acknowledge it or not to love them this way is to remember that they are not beyond the grace and mercy of God that he can as he chooses still use them for his glory and why is loving our enemies so important to Jesus do you suppose I think it has something to do with his goal of making us the light of the world think about it he is forever calling us to go against what comes naturally to us that which is born of this world and often our fallen nature too. Whether it be turning the other cheek or forgiving someone who's betrayed us or recognizing that the wrong use of words can be like murder or the wrong turn of thoughts can already make us adulterers. Jesus wants his people to stand out, not blend in. He wants us to rise above the way the crowd is going, to march to the beat of a different drummer, even, even a carpenter from Nazareth. As he also said in our text, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? In short, loving those who love us back is the norm. It's expected. But loving our enemies, well, that's abnormal, isn't it? It's the unexpected. And that's the point. Because as the text also highlights, if we love our enemies, then we are clearly identified as children of the Father in heaven. Members of God's family, set apart for special purposes, and people will take notice. They will see the difference in us. You believe that? No? Okay, well. <laughs> it's true, right? That's how God wants us to be witnesses to the world which is so broken all around us. And Jesus doesn't just leave us hanging there in Matthew 5 trying to figure out how to love those who oppose us. He gives us a key activity to engage in that will help us find our way. What did he tell us to do? Huh? He said to pray. For those who persecute you. Pray for them. And I don't think he meant pray that they get what they got coming to them. Although that's a tempting prayer to pray. Right? Do it God. You can do it. Right? Mm -hmm. nah. I don't think that's how Jesus meant that. I think he intends for something more. Why should we pray for our enemies? Because when someone becomes your enemy... They can grow less and less human to you as the war drags on. Instead of a person, they become a cause of anxiety, a source 
of frustration, an object of angst and bitterness. But when you pray for them, when you take them before the throne of grace, the power of God is released to keep them as they also are. A human being, a husband or wife, a mother or father, a person with problems who probably has enemies of their own. Praying for enemies is like hugging on the velveteen rabbit. It makes them real, which creates the space for the Holy Spirit to do a new thing in your life and maybe in their lives too. The question is, how do you pray for them? Uh, how do you find the words? Uh, I like what the co-founder of Harvest Prayer Ministries, Kim Butts, has written about this. She recommends that if you struggle to find the right words in this challenging arena, then pray the scriptures for your enemies. Take the word of God and use it in your prayers for those who would oppose you. And she gives us some strong examples from, uh, she takes it from the book of Colossians. Listen to how she puts it here. She says, quote, pray that God will rescue your enemy from the dominion of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of the sun. That they will rid themselves of all anger, rage, malice, and slander. That they will become one of God's children, holy and dearly loved, clothed in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That they will know and possess the love of God. That the peace of Christ will rule and reign in their hearts. When we pray the word of God into someone's life, we release a power into them unlike anything else on earth. When we live the word of God out, especially when it comes to loving our enemies, we open the door for extraordinary things to happen. It's what happened to Dan Cathy. The CEO of Chick-fil-A. How many love Chick-fil-A? Oh my gosh. Number one fast food restaurant in the whole country for good reasons. Ah. But, but back in 2012, Dan Cathy, the CEO of Chick-fil-A, found himself in a huge controversy. Remember that? Uh, it was recorded, talked about, documented in a Christianity Today article which is titled Chick-fil-A's Lesson on Loving Your Enemies. Cathy made it known that as a Christian, he could not personally support gay marriage. And his stand had a polarizing effect on both fronts as those for gay marriage boycotted his restaurants and those opposed to gay marriage flocked to Chick-fil-A's in droves. You probably remember the, the protest signs and the long lines all mixed together back in that day. Well, tensions grew and heated words were exchanged, but then Dan Cathy decided to do the biblical thing. He moved toward his enemy. In this case, a man named Shane Winmeyer, a campus pride director, a gay activist, an openly gay man. Kathy reached out to Winmeyer to hear more about the LGBT concerns regarding his company. Kathy modeled something powerful when he said, quote, we don't have to agree with our enemies but we still have to honor and love them. Thank you. So Dan Cathy contacts Shane Winmeyer and says, let's sit down and just have a conversation about this. Let's talk together. And that's what they did. And much to everyone's surprise, Shane Winmeyer later declared himself to be Dan Cathy's friend. And he was quoted in the Huffington Post article after their meeting saying this, quote, the current cultural milieu seems to have hoodwinked us to believe the false premise that we must both agree with and bless our enemies' choices in order to love them. Christianity does not give us permission to dishonor or disregard those whom we perceive as enemies. It also does not require us to come into agreement with their perspectives as a prerequisite to sharing the love of Christ. Dan Cathy seemed to get this. When we can grasp the reality that others are worthy of our love, 
simply because they are made in God's image, not because they agree with us, bridging ideological divides becomes possible. How might our lives look if instead of cutting off relationships, we chose to say, I don't share your conviction on that topic, but I would like to hear more about why this is so important to you. If nothing else, listening well dials down the defensiveness and allows for empathy, which moves us in the direction of love. End quote. Moving in the direction of love is what Jesus calls us to do. Does it actually open the door for reconciliation with our enemies like it did for Dan Cathy and Shane Winmeyer? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. We can offer peace to our enemy and find it accepted. We may offer peace but learn it will only be received if we concede to everything our enemy demands. And that may not honor God. In the end, it's in God's hands, right? As Paul instructs us in the book of Romans chapter 12, do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. What Paul say? As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Which means we're all called to do our part, right? To love our enemies and pray for them. And then we got to let the Holy Spirit do his part, right? And see how the one who stands against us responds. Remember, God doesn't tell us we have to win our enemy. God doesn't tell us we have to change our enemy. God tells us we got to love her. Love them, also pray for them. How humbling it is to come before this table this morning. And remember that the one whose body was broken for our sins, whose blood was shed for our transgressions, as he, as he, hung, as he hung naked in the rain, nailed to a cross, dying in the presence of mockers and skeptics, of traitors and enemies, this same Jesus could lift his eyes to heaven and pray, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Praying for his enemies. Like the old hymn asks, What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul? bear the dreadful curse for my soul. What wondrous love is this? It is God's love, fully revealed in the face of Jesus. A love that freely flows into our lives and is meant to flow out into the lives of others. It is easy for us to release it to our family and friends. It's only natural. But how about for the one who turns their back on us in contempt? The one who cuts down your character with harsh words. Who plots evil against you. The word of God is tough. But the teaching is clear. Mercy is kind to enemies. 
question is, are we? May God help us to know and to do His perfect will.